Glaucoma was a place where we didn't have a lot of options. We all know that eye drops have a bad relationship with the ocular surface. 60% of patients are not using the prescribed medications. The dogma initially of glaucoma for so long has always been treat with drops, treat with drops as much as we can, and hold off on surgery for as long as we can. It's really hard to get out of that mindset. So for a long time, the best way or the best approach we all felt was watching, waiting, and then looking for progression on disease before we would intervene, especially surgically. The main drawback for a watch and wait approach for glaucoma management would be that when the individual really requires treatment, they then really need to have uh, a very aggressive treatment. At times, the disease is already quite active. Compared to if you treated them at an earlier stage, there would be then less burden on the hospital systems as well as patients' quality of life would be less impacted. The escalating burden of glaucoma demands solutions that extend beyond traditional eye drops. Recent years have witnessed an expansion in treatment options that allow physicians to treat glaucoma earlier procedurally. The evolution has been termed interventional glaucoma. This video follows three surgeons across diverse settings and explores how interventional glaucoma is changing the way they manage glaucoma care. Whenever patients come in and they've been diagnosed with glaucoma, it's like a life sentence. And uh, especially when you tell them you've got to put these eye drops in, um, otherwise you're going to lose your sight. A lot of individuals, first of all, go into denial. It's really hard for individuals who are newly diagnosed to accept that they need to take some medication when they are generally feeling quite well. Taking eye drops can sometimes be a social stigma as well. Patients then try to skirt the issue of having to use the drops regularly and that's where non-compliance comes in. The emotions are not so much maybe about losing sight but about losing independence, not being able to drive, not being able to make my own decisions about, about what I do and when. With conditions that you aren't necessarily aware that you're getting worse, the watch and wait approach just does not work in terms of making sure that patients are stable and not at risk of losing vision. If we don't have some way of ensuring patient independent stability of disease, there is the chance that a few missed appointments or a delay in accessing care to start with, you have patients who have come to significant harm. And of course in glaucoma, all we can do is try and maintain what's there. We can never give back what's lost. Quality of life for a glaucoma patient has not been discussed in the past because we didn't have, I think, the luxury of thinking about it because we were trying to stop a blinding disease without as many tools as we have now. I never would walk into the room with a patient with one drop who was doing really well and say, how are you really doing with your eye drop? That discussion has completely changed now that I have all of these other options. And so now I can say to somebody, how are we really doing with a drop? Or walk in and just see their eyes are red, irritated. And I say, obviously what we are doing is not working for you. And we need to talk about other options. These options, laser, MIGs, and procedural pharmaceuticals, provide a spectrum of care, bridging the gap between traditional drops and more invasive procedures. So for interventional glaucoma management, you're really sort of curating your uh, treatment plan for that individual based on all the um, tools that you have to hand, meaning eye drops, lasers, MIGs, um, drainage devices, incisional surgeries. All of that is a whole suite of um, sort of tools that you can then put down a plan for each individual. Laser is very good for patients who either do not want eye drops at all, they're just adamant, they can't put this in their eyes. Um, I think laser for newly diagnosed patients, uh, if they are the right um, group, it works very well. But only if they are either treatment naive or at most on two medications because um, the, the, the risk is, is that when you perform the laser, there is a likelihood that they need to have retreatments um, or it may not even work. Those are the sort of minor limitations of laser. I know that with the light study, which was done looking at um, 
more European-based uh, monetary system and their healthcare system, but they looked at the drop option versus looking at laser option and found that not only was the laser option superior in terms of long-term results with visual field loss, but also it showed that it was cheaper. And then also on top of all of that, we're talking about slowing down the progression of disease to a place where hopefully people don't need multiple medications, larger surgeries, and a lot more uh, time spent in clinic. Then I think about using procedural pharmaceuticals because again, this is something that's working 24 hours a day in the eye. And I think that's the big, the big idea with interventional glaucoma is I want something that's always working that's always functioning 24 hours a day. And no matter how compliant a patient may be with drops, that drop is always waxing and waning with how well it's working throughout 24 hours. As opposed to with intervention and going into the eye, whether again, it's some form of laser, pharmaceutical, we're talking about something that should shift the diurnal curve, flatten that curve, and be working 24 hours a day. The shift towards 24 seven IOP control with procedural pharmaceuticals, lasers, and MIGs is redefining first-line treatment. Yet the true game-changer in glaucoma management is MIGs, offering an even more transformative approach. The introduction of microinvasive or minimally invasive glaucoma techniques offers us this fantastic opportunity to intervene earlier in the disease, particularly with devices that have fantastic safety profiles. So patients can almost immediately feel the benefits of, for example, less drops that they have to use every day, more comfortable eyes, better quality of vision. And then that translates even further into maintaining their vision for much, much longer. So when MIX came along, I sort of like looked at it cautiously optimistic. Does it make sense to me logically, anatomically? Um, would it have a good chance to deliver what it promises. My first um, experience with a MIGS was with the um, eye stent. It made sense to me how it was going to work um, and it did not violate the conjunctiva. You're not trying to really dramatically lower the pressure on some of the advanced cases but it can improve quality of life or help with a reduction of drop burden for patients who are in um, the more earlier stages of glaucoma. MIG's development saw a key advancement with the eye stent. Developed by Glaucos Corporation, the first prototype was created in 1999. Following successful human implants and CE mark approval, the eye stent became the first MIGS device to receive FDA approval in the US in 2012. So I remember the very first time that I put an eye stent generation one in, and that was back in 2010, so many, many years ago. And it did feel very exciting to be able to have something in your hand that you could place into a patient's eye that made complete sense in terms of anatomy, physiology, precision, medical engineering, because for a long time we hadn't really had those advances in glaucoma surgical care. I think what I really enjoyed about implanting the first types of MIGS devices was how elegant it was, how atraumatic it was. We started off very cautious in terms of our follow-up and we saw patients much more frequently than we would have done for cataract surgery alone, but we very quickly learned that these devices were very safe and easy to use, and so then we start to relax our regimes. When I discovered that my pressure had increased significantly, and I was really lucky that I had a consultant who went ahead straight away with surgery to include the removal of the cataract and to put in stents, which not only will prevent any furthering sight loss, but also means I don't have to take drops. It can be a little overwhelming, very honestly, to think about becoming an interventionalist because there's so many different options. And a lot I think that you kind of need to learn in order to fully offer the entire gamut of what we have available and interventional. I started with an eye stent. Uh, which was the original minimally invasive glaucoma surgery. And I learned that technique and then started to slowly like add to my armamentarium, but that was as things started to come out onto the market. And then I started to see patients after surgery, um, after minimally invasive surgery and seeing how happy they were off of medication, seeing how thrilled they were that there was another option outside of just drop. And that got me really excited about the idea of that I could do more and be better at what I did than what I was currently doing. 
So when I think of cataract surgery, anybody who has glaucoma should be offered minimally invasives. I find it to be something that you're not giving the patient the best care if you're not offering a minimally invasive technique at the same time. So for me, that's, it's a hard stop for me. I think my standalone procedure percentage has continued to climb. Once you have the confidence of knowing that you can do these techniques, then you start to say, hey, you've already had cataract, or you're not ready yet for cataract, but I really think I can help you and help your drain and help your structure by doing X, Y, and Z technique. Now that we have more confidence in the success rates around minimally invasives, um, I'm continuing again to see more of that standalone continue to climb. The benefits of interventional glaucoma extend beyond the individual patient, potentially offering significant improvements in healthcare system efficiency and resource management. These techniques, because they're effective, they're safe, they improve quality of life, and also, I would argue, they transform healthcare systems, making them more efficient, and also makes it, us, it easier for us to look after huge numbers of patients coming through with ever dwindling resources. So interventional glaucoma starts with a micro procedure that has wide-ranging macro benefits. The IG is, is important in terms of being able to manage glaucoma in a more uh, collaborative way with our community optoms. We're able to move patients out into the community if they have um, a procedure done where they don't need to have regular follow-ups because their disease is very well controlled so that we can then concentrate more of our resources, time and effort for those that are struggling with controlling their glaucoma or really need a lot of help from other subspecialties or you know intensive surgical management and follow-ups. There truly just are not enough glaucoma specialists to be able to see all the patients that are out there. As the glaucoma specialists start doing earlier intervention with the patients, they're able to use their counterpart in the optometrist to help manage these, up, these patients in a much better way as they lower the pressures, have a longer term impact for them, and the optometrist continues to monitor it. Traditionally, the optometrist would manage the patient the best they could, but as soon as they became uncontrolled, they pass it off to the glaucoma specialist, probably never to be seen again as we work together. The ophthalmologist will have more procedural opportunities to be able to intervene without being bogged down with the, the year over year visit with a patient that's a severe glaucoma that is continuing to progress. They can intervene earlier, they can manage the pressure better, they can manage the optic nerve better earlier on and avoid the massive shunts or trabeculectomies or other problems we have. Now I'm doing a lot of shared care and co-management with optometrists um, who I know, trust, and have helped to actually grow to understand their glaucoma, um, their knowledge, and how I like to treat and intervene. And as a unit and as a team, we're doing better at managing patients so that I can have continued to have more and more extenders come out around me to help me um, treat and take care of all these patients who are otherwise doing well. I feel like it impacts it in a good way because it helps us learn more because we go to these different trainings and we learn about all these mixed procedures. So we, as technicians and scribes, we are here to kind of build a bridge between the doctor and the patient in a way that they're not so afraid to talk to the doctor about mixed procedures and where they don't know what's going on. So we are that happy medium the shift towards interventional glaucoma, though promising, faces challenges. Overcoming long-established practices and demonstrating the long-term value of these new approaches requires dedicated effort. In terms of introducing it into a whole practice, there is definitely something off-putting to commissioners and those who pay for treatments when you say, I want to do this procedure that costs a little bit more now and what you really need is you need a glaucoma consultant and those who are really experienced in looking after these patients to advocate really, really strongly, take every opportunity to spread the word about how transformative this care is. And the cost utility data for this procedure in terms of interventional glaucoma is now widely available, particularly for some of the trabecular micro bypass dents that have been in the market for a long, long time. And as I often say to my team, you know, there are very persuasive 
um, arguments around all sorts of healthcare treatment plans, but only the glaucoma and ophthalmic surgeons can advocate for the, for the patients that we're looking after. I think talking to patients with confidence quells a lot of concern about surgery before it even becomes a concern. For a lot of patients, what they know about glaucoma is glaucoma drops. It's almost like they're synonymous. And so hearing about surgical options, sometimes you know people can have a small question mark you know, going on in their head. Initially saying, this is how I like to treat glaucoma because I know that if I do this intervention, whatever the intervention is at that moment that we're discussing, that the rate of progression of your disease will slow down. And I think if you're just open and honest and tell them why, um, I think it's wonderful reasons to go forward in that path. If you could go back and give your younger self one piece of advice about managing glaucoma, what would it be? I would say persevere with making the time to listen to the patient at first or second appointment because I found that going forward that definitely helped the patient make good treatment decisions and it definitely helped me look after them better. So I would say even when things feel overwhelming in terms of numbers and service load, really take that opportunity to connect early and think about what is important for them because it makes both of your lives easier in the long run.